Okay, today we're ready to continue our series in the Psalms. Uh, we will be sticking to one psalm today, Psalm 18. So if you will, turn there and to verse 1. We read, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Eternal the words of this song on the day that the Eternal delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now this psalm, is almost identical to the Song of David found back in 2 Samuel 22, which is what we just sang in the, open, in the opening hymns, second one, one we just finished. We just sang, so I don't know, maybe we could just close up our books and that's it for the day. You know, we've already had the sermon in that hymn. But it is, it, they, in, in the hymnal, it's referred to 2 Samuel 22 but you will find it's almost identical. There's just a few things that have been altered from 2 Samuel 22. Now, even though David's purpose in writing this psalm, like most of his psalms, was to relate his own personal feelings or record his own personal experiences, the spirit of Christ in him inspired him to record his feelings, and his experiences in such a way as to reveal details of what his descendant, the Messiah, would also experience. In every one of them, we're going to find that that's the case. Now, this psalm clearly reveals in a number of places that the Messiah would come twice. There is no question, if you look at this psalm for what it brings out, he would be coming twice, the first time to live a perfect life and die, and the second time to rule all nations. So it's all brought out, as we just sang. So anyway, we move on then in verse 1. And he said, that is the eternal said, I will love you, or simply love. I love you, O eternal. I love you, O Eternal. Jesus kept the Ten Commandments perfectly. And in so doing, he exhibited the totality of his love for his Father. He set the example of how to fulfill the first great commandment in the law. And what was that? Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Because this statement here in the closing uh, verse, uh, the closing part of verse 1 of Psalm 18, I love you, O eternal, is certainly brought out here. Matthew 22, verse 36, teacher, he was asked, which is the great commandment in the law? What's the great commandment? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord, the eternal, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Then so back here in Psalm 18, verse 1, and he said, I love you, O eternal. I love you. And that's what he meant here. The first great or the great commandment in the law. He loved him with all of his being in total. Going on in verse 1 of Psalm 18, I will love you, O eternal, my strength. My strength. So he, he establishes the importance of the strength that he received from the Father. While a mortal individual, while a mortal with a limited lifespan, Jesus relied completely at all times on the Father for his strength. We mentioned last time uh, that memory scripture, John 5.30, uh, again, you know, he, he's very clear. I can of myself do nothing. Of myself do nothing. He did it all on the strength of his father. And so that's what he's bringing out. Yes, we can apply this to David because David certainly, this was his experience with, you know, without, with getting away from Saul and not uh, being destroyed by Saul. But again, it's all written for pr the prophetic purpose of Messianic prophecy. Going on in verse 2, the New Living Translation has, 
the eternal is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, or as it is in the New King James, the horn of my salvation. That's the power, the power. The horn is the power, refers to power. And my place of safety, or my stronghold, or my refuge, different translations have. Jesus Christ placed all of his trust in the Father to protect him throughout his time in the flesh, and then relied on his power to raise him from the dead after accomplishing the purpose for emptying himself of eternal life in order to become a mortal and die, as Paul brings out in Philippians chapter 2. So he had to rely completely on the Father throughout the duration of his mortal life and to raise him from the dead at the conclusion of that mortal life. Verse 3, the Revised English Bible translates, I shall call to the Eternal, to whom all praise is due. Then I shall be made safe, or simply saved, the New King James has, I will be saved from my enemies. Because he had inspired his prophets to record some very specific events that, would, that he would experience while a mortal. Because of those prophecies, he was the one, God the Word, that inspired the prophets to record them. He knew. He knew throughout the duration, as, as the Father continued to give him more memory of what it was to be an eternal being, he knew then from those prophecies that the religious leaders would lie about him because it's prophesied and that they would demand that he be put to death. It's prophesied. He knew that he would be crucified by the Romans. That was prophesied. The manner of death and the Romans were the ones administering that type of death there in Judea. And he knew he would be vilified by the religious leaders while hanging on the stake, which we're going to see very clearly in Psalm 22, probably next time or the time after or sometime in the future. Okay. He knew. He knew these things. These were his enemies. And as it says here, then I will be made safe from my enemies. Now, these were his enemies, and yet, there was one more. The most powerful enemy he faced was the one that would terminate his life. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 26? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's the last enemy. And death was his enemy. And he is praising God, I then shall I be made safe, or then I shall be saved from my enemies. Knowing the enemies he was to encounter, the religious leaders, the Romans, etc., he called upon the Father. Remember back in Matthew 26? He called upon the Father three times in the Garden of Gethsemane to deliver him from his enemies. And he, of course, asked if there was some other way, but he said, I know, it's your will that must be done. And he had to die. And he needed to be saved from that enemy. He needed to be resurrected. And so he prayed for that. So again, verse 3 very clearly uh, is focused on the Messiah. Going on in verse 4, the King James translates, the sorrows, other translations would have ropes or cords. The cords of death compassed me, surrounded me. And the floods of ungodly men or ungodliness, or destruction, other translations have. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Or as the New English translation has here, overwhelmed me. It overwhelmed me, these floods, all of these ungodly men that came to take him. These were the emotions, what we read here in verse 4. These were the emotions that Jesus experienced when the time came for him to fulfill the sacrifice as the Lamb of God. 
He declared that he was in turmoil. If you'll remember back in John, I think it was chapter 12, he, he uh, again said that he was in turmoil about suffering, the suffering and the death that he would soon experience. And so, again, for the last four days, he was very much in knots, his stomach turning because of what he knew he was going to be going through. And just, to, again, in four days from when it first started, at least the first time that he mentions it in John 12. Verse 5, the New Living Translation has, the grave, or Sheol, as the New King James and a number of other translations bring out, but it just means the grave, the grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. Well, again, we know he died on the stake while shedding his blood. Then he was placed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, where his body remained for three days and three nights. Death wrapped ropes around him. He was dead. He was confined to a tomb. Verse 6, in my distress, I called upon the eternal and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. My cry came before him even to his ears. Before being arrested, he had prayed to the God, the Father Most High, asking for deliverance. He asked for deliverance. The father sent an angel, remember there in Luke's account, it was in Luke 22, verse 40 or something. Uh, he sent an angel to strengthen Jesus for the suffering and for the death that he was required by prophecy and by the plan of God to be fulfilled that he had to experience. Then after three days, the father delivered him from death. And so he cried in his distress before he was put to death. And then he heard, and by the hearing, he resurrected him. Then, verse 7, the earth shook and trembled. Now, this verse, verse 7, uh, as we go on in verse 7 here, this verse connects the conclusion of the first coming of the Messiah with the preludes to his second coming. There were two earthquakes that closed out his first coming. One was at the moment that he died, and the other at the time that he exited the tomb after having been resurrected several hours earlier. In Matthew chapter 27, we read about what happened at the moment of his death. Matthew 27 and verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice after he was given the sponge with the vinegar, uh, with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and rocked. The rocks were split. So at the moment of his death, there was an earthquake. The earth shook, the earth trembled. And then we find... Three days, three nights later, <clears throat> we come to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 1. I'll read from the Darby translation because uh, it and Lamsa uh, better bring this out. It's not at the break of day. It's at the break or the beginning of the first day. That is, it's immediately after the end of the Sabbath. And so we read here, now late on Sabbath. As it was the dusk of the next day after Sabbath. That would be the first day of the week. It was very, the very first part was beginning, the evening part of the first day of the week. Came Mary of Magdala and the other Mary to look at the sepulcher. The New American Standard goes on in verse 2. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. That is, right before they had gotten there, or shortly before they had gotten there. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his garment as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, 
For I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. And so the tomb again was opened, but he was gone. He was no longer in there. His body was placed in there as the sun was setting, ending the day, the, uh, day of Wednesday. And uh, again, he was to come out about that same time, three days, three nights exactly later, uh, so right as right before. So just probably just uh, 15 minutes or so, maybe, maybe half an hour before Mary uh, Magdalene and the other Mary uh, came to the tomb. It had already, that earthquake had happened uh, when the angel came down. So we have two earthquakes involved, his death and the time when the tomb was opened for him to fulfill what he prof uh, prophesied about the sign of Jonah being, uh, as, as a sign of him being the Messiah. All right, back again in Psalm 18. Then the earth shook, verse 7, and trembled, and the fountains of the hills, or other translations say mountains, the foundations of the mountains also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Now, he wasn't angry when he was raised from the dead. He wasn't angry when he died on the stake. These are different earthquakes now. This refers to the earthquakes related to the Messiah's second coming. First of all, the one that occurs, let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. First one is the one that occurs at the time of the opening of the sixth seal. Here in Revelation 6, verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Pretty significant earthquake here. And the kings of the earth the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. The wrath of the lamb. He is angry. This earthquake is at a time that he's angry. The wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? All right, this earthquake also, the second earthquake that uh, occurs at the Messiah's second coming, is the one that strikes at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet in Revelation 11. Revelation 11, verse 11. Now, and this is speaking of what happened with the two witnesses after they were killed. Now, after the three, day, three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. At the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, they, were, uh, uh, res they will be resurrected and ascend up at the same time that the trumpet is blown and a loud voice uh, you know, for the, the dead to come out of their graves, except these are going to be given life in the bodies as a sign, as a witness, so they can see them. Their spirit, they wouldn't be able to see them as they ascended up. So that one is at the seventh trumpet. Then there's the one over here in Revelation 16 that causes massive devastation during the seventh bowl plague. See, seven is connected to almost all of these. Seventh seal, seventh trumpet, seventh bowl. 
And here in verse 17 of Revelation 16, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. That is, the final bowl of the wrath of God has now been poured. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now, that same earthquake is being referred to back here in Revelation 11. Revelation 11, verse 19. This is after the seventh trumpet is blown, the resurrection and all uh, takes place. But down here in verse 19, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquakes. Same thing that we just read back in Revelation 16, verse 18. And an earthquake and great hail. So the great hail is associated with that last part of the seventh bowl plague. Now, that's three earthquakes. We have a fourth, a fourth at the coming of Christ. And that's the one over here in Zechariah 14 that is immediately triggered when the Messiah returns to the Mount of Olives, which is where he ascended in a cloud and where he will come down. Here in Zechariah 14, verse 4, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And if it's going to do that, believe me, that's a pretty good earthquake to split that mountain. So there are four earthquakes associated with the second coming, two with the close of the first coming. Back in Psalm 18 again, verse 8. Psalm 18, verse 8. Smoke went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. Now, believe it or not, this verse is not literal. It is metaphoric. It's a metaphoric depiction of the wrath of God that's poured out on the earth through the seven uh, trumpet plagues. You know, it's the wrath of the Lamb who can abide the great day of his wrath. Okay, we just read that in Revelation chapter 6. And so this is what it's talking about. This is kind of like a, an old Basil Wolverton uh, 1975 in prophecy uh, you know, depiction. Uh, but that's all it is. It's metaphoric. It's not literal. It's not literal. There are things that people take out of the Psalms and say it's literal. You know? And so you've got people who believe some different things about the earth. Uh, and how it's, well, anyway, I won't get into that. Uh, metaphoric things, metaphoric things that you'll find in the Psalms because God does not look like this and God does not have, you know, smoke coming out of his ears and whatever. All right, going on in verse 9, the New Living Translation. He opened the heavens and came down. Dark storm clouds were beneath his feet. Remember, there's anger. He will come out of heaven, according to Revelation, twice. He will come out of heaven twice. The first time, let's go back and note what Jesus says in the Olivet Prophecy, Matthew chapter 24. The first time will be at the sounding of the seventh trump, when the first resurrection occurs. Here in Matthew 24, verse 30. Matthew 24, 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. They will all be gathered up and then they will follow him wherever he goes. Now, Psalm 18, verse 10. 
and he rode upon a cherub and flew. Now, we just read about him coming down in clouds, dark storm clouds beneath his feet. Now he's riding on a cherub. He rode on a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind, that is, quickly. The second time he comes, this is the talking about the second time. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 to verse 11. Because the second time that he comes out of heaven will be at the conclusion of of the marriage supper and after the seventh bowl plague has been poured out on the earth. And here in verse 11, John in relating the vision that God gave him on the Isle of Patmos says, Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Now this is not a literal horse, it is a spirit horse. It's an angel that looks like a horse. You know, the vast majority of angels look like animals. And we look like God. Surprise, surprise. You know, God has modeled what we have on this earth after where He is in the realm of spirit. And He created angels with these unique characteristics, and there are at least 144,000 and one of these cherubs with wings that look like white horses with wings. Pegasus, as we sometimes would say in mythology, is what it looks like. All right. I saw heaven open a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him, on white horses. And again, these are all angels that are modeled, well, the horses and the, today are modeled after these horses that are angelic beings. All right, back in Psalm 18 again. We're going to come back to Revelation a couple of more times. So, Okay, Psalm 18 and beginning in verse 11, New Revised Standard. He made darkness his covering around him, his canopy thick clouds, dark with water. That is the canopy, that which was around him. He was surrounded by this canopy of thick clouds, and this is dark with water. So these aren't white clouds. These are storm clouds uh, that, that are around him. Going on in verse 12, the New Living Translation, thick clouds shielded the brightness around him. Again, he's more brilliant in his glorified state than the sun. And so these clouds shield him in that way, shield the brightness around him, and rain down hail and burning coals. Keep that in mind. We've already read Revelation 16 about this. Verse 13, the Lord, the Eternal, thundered from heaven. And the Most High uttered His voice. So thunder, again, this has the, in other words, this has the support of the Father. This is the Father's will that's being carried out because He's the Most High. He's the Most High. And so all that's taking place is by the Father's will. Hailstones and coals of fire. Verse 14 from the Tanakh translation, He let fly His shafts or arrows as the New King James brings out. He let fly his arrows and scattered them. He discharged lightning and routed them. That is, all of these armies that are assembled to war against him. There, verse 15, Then the channels of the sea were seen, or better in the Tanakh, and the ocean bed was exposed. That means the water's got to be moved. The foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Eternal, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Now, these verses, verse 11 through 15, describe the events. Let's go back to Revelation 16 again. Describes the events that compose the seventh bowl plague. The seventh bowl plague. Notice here, Revelation 16 and verse 18. 
And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. Skipping down to verse 20, uh, then every island fled away. That is, they disappeared under the waves. And the mountains were not found. Again, the waves. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent, about 110 to 120 pounds, uh, some good-sized hailstones. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. But please note here that the things that are part of the seventh bowl is what we just read back here in Psalm 18, verses 11 through 15. It talks about the ocean bed exposed because of the tsunami effect of the earth trembling and quaking and uh, water moving all over, like flushing civilization down the toilet because of such great and mad. It says these earthquakes are, are greater than they've ever been since man was on the earth. So it's pre pretty strong, pretty strong. All right, back in Psalm 18 again. And verse 16. Psalm 18, 16. He sent from above, or the Tanakh says, He reached down from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Now, the passage beginning here in verse 16 and ending with verse 36 contains some material that seems to be pointed more at David, but it can be just as applicable to David as to his descendant, the Messiah. In this case, I think it's more applicable to David. This verse seems to refer to the time when God chose him out of all of the waters. Remember, uh, Revelation 17, 15 says that, uh, that waters and uh, seas and waters and uh, tongues all symbolize, and peoples all symbolize, uh, or all that symbolizes uh, uh, people. Water symbolizes people, symbolizes nations, symbolizes many languages. So waters here means people. So the time when God chose David out of all of the people of Israel in order to establish the kingly line from which the Messiah would come because he was prophesied to come through the kingly line. All the way back to the time of Jacob. The course of his life, the course of David's life from that moment on was inseparably linked to his love for and trust in God. Going on in verse 17. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. Or as the Tanakh, stone edition of the Tanakh has, when they overpowered me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord, the Eternal, was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place, or the Tanakh translates, He brought me out to freedom. He delivered me because He delighted in me. Like every other mortal that's ever lived, David could not escape the enemy of death. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that we have. He could not escape the enemy of death. He could not escape the chains of the grave that would hold him until the time that he would be set free from the grave at the first resurrection. Based on the following verses, from ver uh, beginning in verse 20, this passage could be another reference to the resurrection of the Messiah but I think it is pertaining more based upon the material through verse 36 to David, as we will see, because it is in conjunction with those who serve the Messiah in the closing days of this age. Verse 20, The Eternal rewarded me according to my righteousness. Now, this part, definitely, uh, I think we're going to see, has to refer to what the Messiah, David's descendant, did during the time that he was a mortal. The Eternal rewarded me according to my righteousness. 
According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the eternal and have not wickedly departed from or rebelled against, New English translation, I have not rebelled against my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me, that they were always there. He never pushed them aside so that he could not reflect on them. Verse 23, the Tanakh translates, I have been blameless toward him and have guarded, notice, blameless before him and have guarded myself against sinning. Verse 24, therefore, the eternal has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now, David could not make these statements about himself because his blamelessness, and he was blameless in God's eyes, but his blamelessness was possible only because of the gracious favor that God extended to him by not imputing his sin to him, as David brings out later on in Psalm 30, 32. We'll see that a little later on. These statements that are made here in these three verses are clearly descriptive of the manner of life of the Messiah at the time of his first coming. During the time he was mortal, he was totally without sin, completely blameless, and therefore was eligible to be raised from the dead to immortality because he himself was clean. Verse 25, with the merciful or faithful, the New Living Translation has, with the merciful or the faithful, you will show yourself merciful or faithful. With a blameless man, or the complete Jewish Bible has, with a sincere man, you will show yourself blameless or you will show him sincere. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. Now, I'm sure we all recognize this from Matthew chapter 5. Because these are some of the blessings that David's descendant, the Messiah, who was the messenger of the covenant, promised to those who would indeed enter into the new covenant. You know, we call them the Beatitudes. Well, he gives us three of them here. And he goes on to say in verse 26, And with the devious you will show yourself shrewd. Now, I think the Lamsa does a better job because this shrewd or devious is talking about being twisted okay and i think uh, or something that's crooked and i think the lamsa translation is a little better and lamsa has here for ver the last part of verse 26 from the crooked you shall turn aside from the crooked you will turn aside god allow in other words god allows those who choose to be morally reprehensible to follow their twisted ways until they experience the culmination of the way that they have chosen to live, which is, as we know from Proverbs 14, verse 12, it's the way of death. He will let them go that way till they die. There is a second resurrection, and that resurrection they will be able to live again, and God will deal with them at that time. But they need to learn that their way will lead to death. They need to experience the death. And then when they come up, they'll be a little more cautious the way they live. Going on in verse 27, For you will save the humble people. Well, again, one of the blessings that the messenger of the covenant promised to the meek or to the humble is the inheritance of the earth. And if you're going to inherit the earth, which is billions of years old, uh, then obviously you're going to have to live it yourself. You're going to have to be brought back from the dead. You're going to have to be given immortality because this earth that you're going to inherit is not just this earth. It's the one that's in the realm of spirit forever and ever. All right. You will save the humble people, but will bring down haughty looks. In other words, you know, most of those who sit around the, the semicircle there in Congress, 
you know, the place of haughty looks. The first thing on the list of the seven things that are abominations in the eyes of God is what? Very first thing. Back in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. These six things does the Lord hate? Yes, seven are an abomination. First thing, proud look or haughty looks. Proud or haughty looks. First thing. So he will bring down the haughty looks because God cannot work with that kind of a mind. So he's going to bring them down. The humble people he'll say. Verse 28, Tanakh translates, It is you who light my lamp. The eternal, my God, lights up my darkness, or the New English translation has, illuminates the darkness around me. Now, the lamp, there are several places, one back in Job, the other one in uh, Proverbs 13.9. You can go to those and you'll find that the lamp actually represents the life. Yes, it represents a lamp like God's Word, but it also represents the life of a man. Life is a lamp. There has to be light burning or there is no consciousness, there's no light. And so the elect, what this is saying here is that the elect understand that the certainty of the continuation of their lives and consciousness is through God's promise of the resurrection. It is you who light my lamp. It's you who give me life, O eternal, who illuminates the darkness around me. That is, in death, then there's going to be illumination. There's going to be resurrection. Verse 29, the complete Jewish Bible translates, With you, or your help, the revised English Bible has, with your help, I can run through, or crush, other translations have, I can crush a whole troop of men. With my God, I can leap a wall. Now we're getting back to experiences that David had and that David is going to have after his resurrection. After being resurrected, David, and as far as David, not just David, but all of the first fruits will follow Jesus Christ at, after being resurrected. They will follow Christ to the sea of glass that stretches out before the throne of the Father, where we know from Revelation 14 and 15, verses 1 and 2, 3, uh, that they will sing praises before the Father, and then they will take part in this incredible marriage supper that is described uh, in the Scripture. Afterward, they will follow him out of heaven when he fights the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, we have some references to that. Jude, back in Jude, verses 14 and 15, Jude, verses 14 and 15, writes, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, uh, that is the evil men earlier, ungodly men earlier in the the book here, or the letter that he wrote. He prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Well, actually 144,000 according to the scripture, to execute judgment on all. No, to execute judgment. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, that is, against Christ. Going on in Psalm 18, Verse 30, Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the eternal is proven or reliable, as some translations have. He is a shield to all who trust in Him or who seek refuge in Him. For who is God except the eternal? And who is a rock except our God? God revealed the perfection of His way. He revealed it to a number of His prophets 
who recorded his revelation in the scrolls that compose what we call today the Holy Scriptures, or we call it the Old Testament. All that he has spoken is truth. All that he has spoken is truth. Completely reliable. Like a rock, he stands steadfast and unchangeable. Remember Malachi 3, verse 6? I am eternal because I change not, you sons of Levi. You're not destroyed. You know, I'm, I'm merciful. And that's the only reason why you're going to exist. But I change not. God is very specific. He is a rock. And that's what David is saying here. Who is a rock except our God? Verse 32, it is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect or makes my way blameless. Note, there are two parts to this. God arms me with strength and God makes my way blameless or perfect. David, and as far as David, all of us, all of God's elect know that the only, the only way that sin can be overcome is through the power of the Spirit of God. It's the only way it can happen is through the power of God's Spirit. And the elect also understand, as did David, that only by the extension of God's gracious favor of not imputing sin and providing forgiveness of sin, can they then be considered blameless? Because every day we go before God and we are to, as 1 John chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 9, I think it is, uh, states that we must confess our sins before him. He who says he is without sin is a liar. Because all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And we still see mistakes that we make. We are not blameless, and therefore we have to rely upon the same thing David did. It's again, Psalm 32, first couple of verses. God does not impute sin. He does not impute sin to those that he has selected who have repented and come under the blood of the Savior. All right, going on verse 33, the New Living Translation. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights or the New English translation has, to negotiate the rugged terrain. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow, or as the New English translation has, even the strongest bow. Verse 35, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great, or the New English translation, your willingness to help enables me to prevail. I have to have your help to do this, basically, is what he's saying here. Verse 36, the complete Jewish Bible, you lengthen the steps I can take, yet my ankles do not turn, or the New King James says, but my feet did not slip. You lengthen the steps. You make it possible for me to make advances far faster than I could otherwise, and I don't trip, I don't fall. You've given me stability. Just as God placed speech, understanding, motor skills, and all of that into Adam at the moment that, he, that God breathed the breath of life and Adam gained consciousness, you know, as soon as he gained consciousness, Adam, Yes, sir. There's communication. And so there were things that were placed in the mind of this. He wasn't a baby. He was, you know, he was a man because he was given a wife, you know, that was composed out of his own body. And so that's not myth. That's not evolution. That's the way it was. And so God immediately began communicating with Adam. And Adam could understand. Adam got up and walked. He didn't crawl around for, for, for 10 months trying to learn how to walk. You know, it was there. It was, it was given to him at creation. And just as all of these things happened to him, so will also God instill in those who are part of the first resurrection who are born spirit, they're going to have a number of things that are instilled in them. They're going to have things placed in them by fiat. They're not going to have to spend time learning, in other words. 
It's just going to be there. And David, again, who is speaking here, and the rest of the resurrected saints are going to be provided the abilities that they will need in order to fulfill their role as the army of Jesus Christ that follows him on white horses out of heaven. People say, well, what, what, how do we do this? It's just going to be. Just like Adam could immediately converse with God. And just like Adam could immediately stand up, walk in the garden with God. You know, and gave the reasons why, well, that should be an elephant because it's got a trunk. And, you know, Adam was able to do all of these things because of what God placed in him at that very moment. The moment he began a physical existence. And so the moment we began a spirit existence, there are going to have to be things that God places in us just like he placed in Adam. All right. Verse uh, 37, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed or conquered, some translations have. Verse 38, New Living Translation, I struck them down so they could not get up. They fell beneath my feet. The focus now returns strictly to the Messiah at his second coming, when he will destroy all of the armies of mankind that will be assembled in the plain of Megiddo that resist him. Back in Zechariah chapter 14, we find out exactly how he strikes them down so they cannot get up. Zechariah 14, verse 12. And this shall be the plague with which the Eternal will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Eternal will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. So this is how they are conquered. This is how they're struck down so that they're not able to get up. Their bodies are going to turn into liquid and flow like a river, a river of blood, according to Revelation 14. Back in Psalm 18, verse 39, for you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies. Or the complete Jewish Bible, you have made my enemies turn their backs in flight so that I destroyed those who hated me. Just as at his first coming. Let's go back over to Revelation 17. Revelation 17, just as at his first coming, the Messiah's second coming will be to fulfill. At his second coming, he will, his will will be to fulfill the will of the Father. And part of the Father's will will be to rid the world of all of those who promote war. That's the Father's will. And he's going to be implementing the Father's will. Here in Revelation 17, verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings or ten rulers, very powerful beings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings or rulers with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. That is, those who follow Him out of heaven. Let's go over to Revelation 19. Two chapters over, Revelation 19, verse 19. John goes on in the vision, and he says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, the ten that we just read about, 17, and their armies 
gathered together to make war against him, Jesus Christ, who sat on the horse and against his army, which will be the resurrected saints, or the saints who are changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, and the dead in Christ. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And so, again, the will of God is to get rid of everyone who promotes war. In Isaiah, uh, Isaiah in Psalm 18 again, and verse 41, they cried out, that is, these armies that are assembled there in the plain of Megiddo, they cried out, but there was none to save. Even to the eternal, even to the eternal did they cry out, apparently, or they will. But he did not answer them. Why? Their sins, their sins have cut them off from God, and God will not acknowledge these individuals until the second resurrection. They've got to experience death for what they did. Isaiah chapter 59, you know, one of those verses we turn to quite frequently because of its importance to us as well as to every other human being. Uh, Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the eternal's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Yeah, he can reach down all right. He can reach in and he can do whatever. Nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Oh, he can hear all right. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. You've done it. You've put the obstacle there. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That is, he refuses to listen. And that's the case for these individuals because they're not going to be blameless. The two witnesses are going to warn the world of what's going to take place. And it's going to warn them, you better not do this. You better not fight against Christ. He is going to return. You know, and one plague after another, and everything they say comes true, and you better, better not go to war against him, because you will unquestionably lose your life, and they're going to do it anyway. Again, Psalm 18, uh, verse 42, then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the streets. The Messiah will conclude the wrath of God, and he'll do so by obliterating the promoters of war. And then afterward, let's turn over to Psalm 46. Afterward, once he establishes his reign, he's going to require the destruction of all instruments of war around the world. Here in Psalm 46, verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Eternal, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. All war-making implements will be destroyed, just like Isaiah writes back here in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, and in verse 2, uh, He shall judge between the nations, Isaiah 2, verse 4. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall, note, beat their swords into plowshares, something useful, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn or train for war anymore. All right? So when Jesus, uh, well, when the Messiah, back here in Psalm 18 again, uh, verse 42 says, I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the streets. You know, it's over and done with. 
You know, all armies are over and done with. All implements of war are over and done with. Going on in verse 43, Psalm 1843, Tanakh translation, you have rescued or you have delivered me from the strife of people, or the Revised English Bible, you have delivered me from the people who challenge me. You have delivered me from the people who challenge me. You've delivered me, and you have delivered me from the people who challenge me. This refers to the closing event of his first coming. This is the closing event of the Messiah's first coming. By resurrecting him, the Father delivered the Messiah, delivered him from his own people who had rejected him and were instrumental in having him put to death at the close of his first coming. You've delivered me from the people. Yep, he did, but he had to die. He had to die. Going on in verse 43, uh, Tanakh, you have set me at the head of nations. Peoples I knew not must serve me. Or the New English translation, I think, is a little better. Peoples over whom I had no authority are now my subjects. Now, notice this cannot apply to David. You have set me at the head of nations. David was set at the head of Israel, but not at the head of nations. Peoples over whom I had no authority are now my subjects. This refers to the focal event at the beginning of Christ's or the Messiah's second coming. By appointment of the Father, he will become king over all people. Over his own people? No, of Israel. And over all nations. Back in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, we find this. Daniel 7, verse 13, Daniel says uh, regarding the visions that he was being given, I was watching in the night visions, Daniel 7, 13. And behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, the Most High, and they brought him before him. Then to him... The Messiah was given dominion or ruling authority, as the New English translation has it, and glory and a kingdom. All of these were given to him that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, the head of the nations. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed will last forever. In Revelation 11, Revelation 11, note what happens at the sounding of the seventh trump here. Revelation 11, verse 15, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the moment when what we read in Daniel chapter 7, 13, and 14 will be fulfilled. That's when he was given the authority. And again, as it said back here in Psalm 18, verse uh, 43, in the uh, New English translation, uh, peoples over whom I had no authority are now my subjects. Because he receives that authority then before the... Sea of, before the Father on the Sea of Glass with the 144,000 accompanying Him. Because they all come in the clouds and they come before the Father. All of that takes place at that moment. Also in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9. Zechariah 14 verse 9. And the Eternal shall be king over all the earth. That means all nations, all peoples. In that day it shall be the eternal is one and his name the only one, New American Standard translates. His name the only one. There won't be any other Chemoshes, Molex, uh, you know, any of the other crazy stuff that people have worshipped through time. Back in Psalm 18, uh, verse 44, Tanakh translates, 
at the mere report of me, they are submissive. Foreign peoples cower before me. Foreign peoples lose courage and come trembling out of their strongholds or their hideouts where they've been because of the horrendous things that are associated with the bowl plagues. By the conclusion of the outpouring of God's wrath, all people will be aware of the infinite power of the Messiah. Nobody can question His power. They will quickly learn the importance of obeying Him if they fail to come up during the Feast of Tabernacles to worship Him. They're going to find out very quickly. It's not a wise thing to do. Once they achieve the proper fear of God, then they will enthusiastically seek to do His will, as we find again in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, verse 2. This is after Christ has established His throne in Jerusalem. Now, Isaiah 2, 2, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Eternal's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. That is, over all nations. Mountains here are symbolic. And shall be exalted above the hills, the lesser nations. And all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. All right, so again, we see here in uh, Psalm 1844, the mere report they're submissive. People lose courage. They come trembling. They finally understand who it is that they're supposed to be worshiping. Verse 46, Psalm 18, The eternal lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. This is the Messiah. The Messiah praising the Father who raised him from the dead, who fulfilled everything that he promised he would do when this plan was first implemented or when this plan was first spoken back and forth between these two eternal beings. This is the way we're going to do it. And it's all come to pass so that he has fulfilled his, mor his, his role as a mortal and is now eternal once again. Verse 47, it is God who avenges me or completely vindicates, New English translation, who completely vindicates me and subdues the peoples or nations, other translations have, who subdues the nations under me. Verse 48, New Revised Standard, who delivered me from my enemies. Indeed, you, speaking to the Most High, the Father, you exalted me above my adversaries. You delivered me from the violent, or the violent men, other translations have. This is the fulfillment, or at least part of, this is part of the fulfillment, what he's speaking of here, part of the fulfillment of the promise that the Father made to the Word, that the Most High made to the Word, back there in, well, let's turn over to Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Eternal said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And here in Psalm 18, it's you delivered me from my enemies. You exalted me above my adversaries. You delivered me from violent men. And again, we look at Psalm 110, verse 1. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And so the credit goes to the Father, the Most High. You did these things, but we have to understand that He did all of these things, just like the creation, through the Word. And so He's going to, again, bring all enemies. I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. He's going to do it, but through the Messiah. The Messiah is the one that does it. The Father does not get involved uh, in this, other than that's His will. And then the Messiah carries out the will of the Father. 
All right, Psalm 18, verse 49. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Eternal, among the nations, or the Gentiles, nations in the Tanakh translation, and sing praises to your name. Now, this is the one who will sit on the throne, King of kings, Lord of lords, ruling all nations from Jerusalem. And he's going to thank and praise the Father. Once he begins reigning as King of kings, the Messiah, just as during his first coming, will continue to point all people to the Father. Because that's, you know, we went, going through John, it was always what? He was always pointing them to the Father, to the Father, to the Father. Because the Father is the direction. We pray to the Father. And he's going to do the same thing. As he sits in his glorified state, at least manifesting himself in a certain amount of glory, uh, so that he can be seen by human beings, he's going to say, you know, you've got to worship the Father. Yeah, he is worshipped also. They must worship him, come up to Jerusalem at the feast to worship him, but they've also got to make sure that they're worshipping the Father. Verse 50, Psalm 18, verse 50, Great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy or loving kindness, revised English Bible. Has, he shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Now, the Messiah will always acknowledge the role of the Father in his life and in his position, as well as the unlimited extent of the Father's love for him and the rest of David's family. Because remember, he's part of the family of David. The loving kindness that's shown. His love for David. His love for David is exhibited in the role that David will have over the nation of Israel during the Messiah's reign, which is brought out back here in Ezekiel chapter 37. Actually, several places, but we'll just go to 37, verse 24. David, my servant, shall be king over them. That is, over both the house of Israel and the house of Judah that will be put back together as one nation and not split into two. Shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And so David will have a very significant role under his descendant, the Messiah, in the kingdom of God.